For this first panel, uh, we're actually going to welcome a couple of people on stage and also a couple of people who will join digitally. Um, so let's run the trailer first. All right. So this panel um, is called Innovation in the Public Sector, and um, this panel shares different perspectives on how design thinking, among other frameworks, fosters the mindset needed for managing and leading a more interconnected, human-centered, and digitized public sector. And I think we all want that, <laughs> so we're very curious to hear from our speakers. Uh, we have digitally joining um, Christina Lang, Lang. Uh, she's the co-founder and managing director um, of Digital Service, the German federal government's digitization unit. Hi, Christina. Her CV uh, spans uh, from private to public sector experience um, and her previous role at the German federal government foreign office in digitalization working group uh, is only one of many. So um, next to her, uh, physically here, we also have uh, Werner Achtert, vice president public sector at MSG Systems AG. He has consulted management decision makers for many years and is currently also developing a program for modern leadership methods in administration. The second person on our digital panel is um, Christian Basin, a global thought leader. Um, he leads the Danish Design Center and had previously also been the director at the Danish government's Mind Lab. He is joining the conversation, I don't even know where you are, but um, maybe in New York City. I know that you're going to be in New York City next week. Um, so let's give a warm welcome to also our panel host. Um, sorry, I don't have so give a first <laughs> uh, warm welcome to our panel host, Angela. Angela is a current program lead at the HPID school and a former student of mine, actually. She was here going through the programs while I was a program lead, and now she stepped into some of my footsteps. She holds a master's degree in public policy. Her focus are change management, digital transformation, and building happier teams. So she will be the one hosting this panel and introducing our final panelists for today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, uh, your online presence, Christina and Christian. So we have three seats today with us. And let me introduce you then, Dr. Dennis Kuttelman. He is the program management manager of the edu digital education and vocational education at the uh, Education Adult Center of the city of Gütesloh, right? Correct. And so let's give it a start to this panel. This panel for me, it's more about building a lively atmosphere to have a nice conversation over these topics. And let's just give it a start. I would like to ask then uh, our dear female panelist, Christina Lang, uh, because she has a very interesting background being a lawyer, then working in consulting, and then CEO and founder of Digital Service, who, which runs Tech for Germany and Work for Germany. Two very interesting programs. Having these in mind, Christina, and let us unpack why are we talking about innovation in the public sector at um, the 15 years anniversary of HPI and design thinking at HPI. I would like you to have in five minutes, six minutes, how does the concepts or these words, design thinking, digitalization, and public sector really come together into your life day to day? Please. Thank you, Angela. Um, so actually from, from our perspective, the whole concept of design thinking or human-centered design also in the German government has made quite an interesting journey in the, journey in the past years. Um, We've seen since the start of Tech for Germany 2018 that it's become more and more present, more um, vocal also in, in the vocabulary within the German government, so within public service, um, talking about the way to 
inc to focus more on what users actually need, what citizens need. We can see that in the coalition agreement of the new government. Um, and I think it's almost a buzzword that people, so public servants can't hear anymore. Like we need to be more agile. We need to be more user centered. What we've seen in the past five years since we've been doing the fellowship program, Tech for Germany, is that there have been some initial successes in showcasing the benefits and the um, the power of design thinking methods um, in various lab formats. It's not only the Tech for Germany program where we analyze problems and prototype solutions based on like a double diamond approach um, over the course of three months with public servants on their digitalization projects with external fellows that bring in the competencies of design, engineering and product management. Um, but there are also other formats. There are innovation teams in various ministries. Um, there are design thinking workshops being conducted. Various labs have been established. Some of them have been closed down again. Um, what we see now, especially in the past one or two years, is that it's important not to view design thinking um, methods to work iteratively and agile also in um, regards to digitalization projects as a nice add-on, but to get to that next steps of incorporating the, those ways of working um, as core principles or as the foundation of uh, certain challenges that government faces and problems government wants to solve. Um, and we see that, especially in the Work for Germany program, where we send experienced uh, coaches or innovation managers, transformation people with transformation experience from other sectors into ministries for six months to work in um, internal government teams, that there are certain challenges that come with trying to incorporate those innovation methods with the way government is used to working. So with traditional um, decision-making structures or distribution of responsibilities. And those are, in our experience, issues that we can't solve outside in or like on paper. We need to really find ways to incorporate methods into projects and then find solutions along the way on um, the challenges that come with this cult culture clash. Um, for example, in, in, in various Work for Germany projects, we've had struggles with finding a balance between um, informal working groups that work together in workshops and um, really kind of blossom and um, have a lot of fun um, working in a different way together. But then how can we incorporate those results um, we've gathered in the workshops in formal decision making structures when it has to basically be fed back into the decision making process that government is used to and that's formalized and has to be adhered to. Um, and we've ha we've seen some initial successes, but we also see some structural barriers that can't be solved on an individual project level or also on the level of like, in individually enabling certain public servants by teaching them, coaching them those methods. Thank you uh, <clears throat> very much. It's really interesting to see uh, these um, interactions between what we think design thinking can be as a toolbox and also as a mindset. So um, I would like to actually, based on what you just said, give the word to Werner, because sure. <laughs> I know that you uh, co-author recently a paper about innovation in the public sector. And there's some point that it says, oh, it is possible, of course, we just need to actually find a better or a fitting framework to make this happen. Yeah. So could you, in your experience, let us know what would that framework be and what could actually a successful innovation uh, in public sector look like? Yeah. In our consultancy projects, we, we see two big challenges. So the first one is um, the administration goes digital. This is, this, is, this is a fact, but the problem is that uh, we have to uh, reconstruct and redesign a lot of interfaces between the administration and the citizens and also within the administration because all these systems are designed not for not really uh, human centered actually so this is the, the one point we need more user centered design and this is uh, what we use design thinking the second uh, challenge is that uh, we have some restrictions so every every structure every process in the public sector 
is uh, ha has to be has to take place in in, a, in, in a certain under certain restrictions. We need stability, reliability, and we need we need legal foundation. So we are not uh, we are, uh, the public administration is not a startup where you can say okay we have a new idea and uh, one week later we have a new product because the products you have to uh, you have to uh, um, uh, offer to the to the public they are dis defined by laws. So and this restriction we have to keep in mind. And uh, what we saw uh, is that uh, the public sector needs a lot of innovation. And design thinking is a very good method for, um, no, not, not a method, it's a mindset for um, bring more innovation. But we have to, 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 to take the people with us, mm. the people in the, in the organizations, the people that have to, they have to work with the, with the systems, with the applications in, in public administration. And we also have to take the, um, the citizens with us, be because this is more an aspect that you will uh, uh, point out, I think. And what you uh, said, uh, we, actually we, we are working on a paper about um, how can we measure the value of innovation in public sector. Mm -hmm. Because this is quite different to normal commercial uh, innovation. In a, in a commercial uh, situation, you can, you can say, I'm a, mobile, I'm a mobile company, I have 400 tariffs and I want to, uh, uh, I want to reduce it to 200. This is not possible in, in the public administration. So uh, we have to, to evaluate the, 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 the value of public, of public uh, innovations. And uh, we, will, yeah, we, we are just in the, in the final, uh, final phase of that. But uh, I can say we, we have to concentrate more on qualitative factors. Qualitative factors like a value for the society, um, value for, for communication with citizens. So and we, we try to, uh, to evaluate uh, or to uh, develop such a system to evaluate and give the public administration um, a tool to evaluate its ex ante and ex post so that you can make political decisions. Where do you invest for new, uh, new um, for, in, for innovation and for new uh, in applications and for new processes? Yeah. Uh, and that brings me to the point, and thank you for your intervention, of course, of uh, what is it that we are saying where we say, oh, it needs to be user-centric, yet it needs to give to um, the citizens. It also reminds me of this book, How to Build an Entrepreneurial State, and how this book argues that actually innovation in the public sector benefits for having this bureaucracy in these forces that makes you be creative and into hacking those structure to build it. However, there's a point that I'd like to raise because you and Christina have also talked about something bigger than government itself. And this is why maybe building on what Christian Basin has been working on recently I would like to ask you whether you are in Copenhagen or in New York or I don't know, um, how can we work toward a human center model for public governance actually? Oh, we cannot hear you. Can't believe I'm repeating this. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me thank now? you. So thanks so much for having me on uh, on the panel today. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be with uh, with the colleagues uh, here, and actually I am with you right now from uh, our space in Copenhagen. Uh, so you can see the uh, uh, rainy weather, and this is the government district uh, in uh, in Copenhagen. Lovely. So um, yeah. So how do we create human-centered governance? You can say, and I, I want to say sort of two, two things or, or share two big ideas with you this, uh, this morning. Uh, one is, of course, uh, related to my, my new book, uh, which is called, um, see if I can get it right here, uh, Expand, Stretching the Future by Design, which is in a way um, a book uh, intended to uh, challenge our thinking about design thinking. And uh, I know it's not the first attempt to, to say that design thinking has gotten us quite far, but maybe we need to go further and to uh, reflect more on uh, how we think when we design 
both when it comes to the timeline on which we design, so the kinds of problems that governments are facing are not problems or challenges that we will solve uh, in five years, but they are a very long-term uh, systemic challenges, so we need to take a longer time perspective. It's also a book that argues that our human-centered design is still very, very important, but we have to put other things at the center of design as well, uh, which means basically all living things, and we need to shift more towards what I would call life-centered design, reminding ourselves that we are, as human beings, also part of nature, and we need to think about nature and the planet, and, and, the, uh, and not least facing climate change, when we consider uh, who we design for. Uh, so those are just two of the, of, of the perspectives in the book. We, we call them expansions, expanding our thinking. And in total, the book has uh, uh, six different uh, suggestions on how we can really expand our, our thinking as we design. Now, that's the one uh, idea I, wanna, I want to share with you. And I think governments are well positioned to embrace more expansive thinking because governments are really holding these types of huge, very systemic uh, challenges, both environmental challenges, but also certainly societal challenges. The other perspective that I want to share is that I've personally been on, on, on a bit of a journey since I first discovered design thinking uh, in, in the mid 2000s as a, as, a, as a concept and idea was, was emerging and became more and more strong and clear around maybe 2010. I've also been, uh, as you know, directing an innovation lab inside government for, for eight years uh, here in, uh, in Denmark and, and connecting uh, with uh, quite a few labs and, uh, and entities around the world that were, in a way, uh, doing similar things as, uh, as we did at uh, MindLab. As uh, we just heard earlier from Christina, these labs also uh, die again, they get shut down again, and they're actually in many ways quite vulnerable and, uh, and in many ways uh, temporary. And why is that? And why is it we also just heard um, from the previous speaker that, that uh, embedding uh, design thinking and design mindsets and uh, practices within government administration is really hard. And so what I'll propose is that a big part of the problem is that we have not created human-centered organizations. And so what we are doing and I'm doing and also writing a new book about is that we need to shift our sort of design lens, our focus uh, internally on, on the organization and really begin to build an uh, entirely new management model. Now that model uh, is uh, already happening many places because it's called heal organizations, it's called a uh, humanocracy. Um, you know, we, we have, a, or holacracy, we have quite a few models out there. I think design and design thinking is, is, is uniquely positioned to help drive the transition, also in the public sector, towards organizations that are much more human, uh, human-centered. So just to give an example, because we've done that in the DDC, my own organization, organizations that are more self-managing, where people choose their own leader, where uh, everyone can offer their leadership to others, so eliminating traditional hierarchy. It's organizations where people uh, move more dynamically to the jobs they want to take on. So in my organization, everybody freely chooses what they want to work on. And in many ways, organizations that are, are, are really flat and, and uh, trusting and uh, human in their environments. And in my mind, that's the only way we can unleash uh, all the human creativity we need to address the big problems we're facing in business and in government, it's also the only way, ultimately, that design thinking can stick and become a, a natural part of a, a, a bureaucracy. Because as it is today, it always feels as a, a foreign body when it's uh, put into uh, a government organization. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> this is also interesting because at D school and the HBIT school, we're also trying to shift our minds to work in this life center um, approach. I think this also embeds a lot of what uh, we are trying to do, not only think about um, barriers, but also think about how to expand this. Um, and this comes with the evolution itself of the concept of design thinking and the possibilities of it. 
Building on that and on how to build and transform from the guts of the organizations, I would like to bring the experience of Dr. Uh, Dennis Kötelman, because in his role in this, at the city level, we can start to see how we are grounding all these big ideas. You know, we're talking about special leadership for public sector innovation. We're talking about building human center um, system applications, for example, we were thinking about how is design thinking really trying to become a mindset. And these are too much of big words. And I would like to hear the story of how the city of Gütersloh, excuse me, and came to the realization that um, they could actually partner up with HPID school to build something interesting. So pay attention because this is how we actually ground innovation in public sector. So Dennis. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, yes, maybe some words on how the Adult Educational Center uh, is connected to the public sector in Gütersloh because in Germany there are different forms of organization of this Adult Educational Center and for middle and uh, higher size cities, they are organized as part of the public sector and in smaller cities often they are organized together, so it's a different part and we are forced by law to offer uh, educational programs for citizens to participate in digital te technologies and so it's our duty to uh, do something there and so we had a session in December uh, for in the Municipal Committee on Digitalization, Economic Development and uh, City Marketing. And we were talking about a lot of projects, uh, mobility app and uh, gardening robots and all digital technology coming into the city. And then there was a politician asking, um, but there's a lot of technology, but I know some many people, they can't use really use their smartphone and their iPad and all the things. So what do you do that citizens can participate on this elaborated digital uh, developments within the city? And so, uh, yes, also the Adult Educational Center was asked, what are you doing? And I could say, yes, we do a lot. And we had good offers and they are very elaborated but the demand is very low. So often we have participants of one, two, three, five persons and many programs we can't really realize because if you ask people, yes, it's important to do this, but then if you offer the program, we can't get them. We are communicating over social media, over newspaper of all, but the participant, uh, participation is very low. So we sat together and we were wondering what can we do to have a better fit between this educational office for digital topics and um, the citizen needs. And so we were wondering what can we do. And then in June, I came to the open house me uh, meeting here at the HPI school, uh, at the school. And uh, then I met Trixi Gumbel and uh, she said, yes, we have an advanced design thinking program. It's a complex problem you have there. And uh, it would be very interesting to realize this advanced design thinking project with you in Gütersloh. And so in October, we will start the project to have a better fit between our offers I, that I think are very good, but it, there's a really lag between the needs that the people articulate. And yes, we want to make it better with this advanced, des advanced design thinking project. Thank you so much. And as you just heard, uh, Christian, he indicated that sometimes we need to go into the leadership and how are we also embedding, embracing that kind of innovation that it's needed. So this is a project we will embark together and we will have your back there. But I would like to actually um, ask our panelists, do you maybe have an advice for Dennis and the city of Gütersloh about how to bring this project forward, maybe from developing software, a human centric, in a human centric way, maybe from the leading part of how to lead these projects, or maybe from the management part of these projects. So, Christina, what could you tell 
uh, Dennis uh, when he's in this innovation project with us? So, I mean, aside of the fellowship programs, probably our most prominent experience is in digitize, uh, developing software projects in a user-centered and agile way. Um, what we've seen on the ministerial level is after close to two years now as digital service where we produce and um, host software, um, is in the beginning we've we haven't had enough focus on setting up the right governance structure and really investing in uh, what are the roles and responsibilities in the project setup and what do we need from our government partner side in order to build software successfully and iteratively um, and invest more in expectation management. So basically from the software development unit side, I think that is something that we need from the public servant side um, and that we now invest in from our side in order to basically get the right setup so that we can then execute um, successfully. Um, but that's probably something that the government side as well can invest in, it's like the, the public sector side, thinking proactively about the distribution of roles and responsibilities in such projects um, and what the expectations are from each side. And um, we've one of the um, methods we've actually used most is like a, a pre-mortem. So thinking about what could go wrong, what are the hopes and fears that we um, have with this certain project, and then um, think proactively about how, what can we do in order to not make the risks become reality. Um, I think it's quite a positive way of framing risks and worries um, as opposed to traditional risk management, the way it is conducted in government, in German government at least, um, most of the time, where if you point out a risk, um, it has to be handled very sensibly um, in order for not anyone to feel like they're pointed out they've done something wrong or they haven't thought something through, but as an inevitable part of project management that risk management is in, in our perspective. Thank you so much. I hope not only you, but also Maria Jose, who is the program lead from the Advanced Track, took note of those amazing ideas. Now I'd like to give uh, the floor to Christian Basin. What kind of advice can you uh, give our friend Dennis? So a few years back, I, I published a book called uh, Leading Public Design. And um, as you mentioned, there's a whole leadership question uh, around this that, that we have to, 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 to look at. And in my mind, a, a lot of public managers and the decision makers, also politicians, could benefit from understanding what their role is as non-designers, uh, but as decision makers in, in um, enabling uh, really, really good uh, human-centered uh, or even life-centered uh, design work. So, so three key points, right? So number one, leading design means being open to challenging your own assumptions, uh, being open-minded around seeing the problem in a different light and being open to the empathy and insight in what citizens need, what users need. Uh, and, and also using those insights and those reframings of problems to really drive change. So, so I think the first point is that leaders in government must uh, be more open and ready to challenge uh, conventional wisdom and the ways things have been done and allow for the human insight to really help drive the change. That's number one. The second piece is of obviously the divergent piece of design thinking. So navigating ambiguity, open-endedness, uh, uncertainty, um, uh, being comfortable in discomfort, uh, because we all know that a design process needs to have space and be able to breathe, uh, getting more inputs from stakeholders, from users, uh, brainstorming and concept development takes time for ideas to mature. And managers, especially those that have been, you know, uh, uh, successful in government, often those that are good at making fast decisions, uh, maintaining control and really shutting down uh, divergent processes. So, so they have to do, do the opposite, which is very hard to do. And I think that's not the, the second point. The third point, 
obviously uh, for, for, for us working with design is to insist on, 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 on the process of, of, of iteration and prototyping and, and, and manifesting in a very concrete way what new solutions would look like and allowing that experimentation to take place and allowing the learnings that come from, from, from also failing, uh, which is another thing that's very hard to do. But all these three processes that we know very well are, are sort of core to, let's call it design methodology, are also key for managers to relate to. And all three of them really challenge, uh, you know, what it looks like to be a, normally to be a successful manager. And, and I think we can train managers and make them aware of, of, of this role uh, to a much larger degree than we do today. Thank you so much. That's a master class in leadership uh, for innovation and design. So I'll listen to this panel later and take notes. And now you, Werner. I think, I think the challenge of Dennis is all about requirement management. Uh, you have to analyze the requirements, and I have done requirements anal analysis and uh, requirements management for a long time in, in software engineering. And uh, I think nowadays we cannot do it with these classical analytical methods. And I think design thinking is a very good way to find a new uh, approach to this requirement engineering. So go out, to the, go out to the people, go out to the users, ask the users, and especially observe the users. I think this is, this is very important in, in this case. You have to, to, have to uh, observe the users. What do they really need? And then go back to your lab and design a, um, a workshop or a course or any, any training program. So this is uh, one thing I have learned with design thinking, um, to observe, not, not to uh, construct systems with these classical ways, classical methods like waterfall methods, where we analyzed years I have seen a lot of problems, especially in the public sector, where we analyzed years and years, and after, after we have the, the analyst was ready, the problem was gone. So, and I think this is, this is one thing we have to learn in, in, with design thinking, especially in the public sector. Age, being agile, as Christina said, being agile, being iterative, and observe the, the, the customer. Maybe the customer in your case, the, the public, the citizens, and also the, the employees in the public sector. This would be my advice. User and human diversity, how to design for that, right? Um, I would have one comment um, because uh, I worked 10 years in doing surveys and market research in a quantitative way. And so we had a discussion. Maybe it's a possibility to do a survey with a citizen just to observe uh, what are their needs. But I thought, OK, I know the limitation of asking would you go to the program and how might it be? So I think design thinking is a better method to get to the needs and how to construct a good uh, program, educational program for digital topics. But this was also part of uh, the discussion, not just doing a survey and asking uh, citizens, what do you need? But we think design thinking is how should He cannot uh, know what he needs before he has seen it. Yes. Thank you so much. And of course, being an anthropologist, I love why uh, these kinds of questions don't really work, because we do different as we say and what we mean. And this triangulation is what makes the world go round. I would like to have some time for questions for the audience. So I would like to finish on what quick fire question with my lovely panelists today. And the question is basically, fill the blank. Innovation in the public sector, to me, is very shortly one sentence, one word. One word, Christian. I saw, you, I see you smiling. So go first. More important than ever. Okay. Yes. More important than ever, Christina. Innovation in public sector, to me, is uh, powerful, <laughs> challenging, and inevitable. Mm hmm. Uh, Werner. Um, it is changing the m mindset. Uh, sorry, it's uh, changing the mindset. Powerful. Oh my God, those quotes. I will just put those on t-shirts and sell them. <laughs> and Dennis, innovation in the public sector to me is... Uh, hopefully it's a tool to improve the fit between public uh, services, uh, public service offers and citizens' needs. Thank you so much. And just to close on that, Innovation in the public sector to me is what makes my heart go 
Doom, doom, doom. My eyes shine and it's my true passion. So thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. Thank you, Kristen. To me, it's such an honor to be here with you talking about why it, what really, really passionates me. And uh, now we have some time for closing questions from the audience that our dear third Christian here on stage will take. Thank you right. so much. Um, all right, so um, thank you first of all. Yes, give a big applause. All right, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, we have actually also a, an additional add-on, let's say, uh, to this conversation because we have someone here who can speak from the city of Potsdam's perspective on becoming a smart city. So I will also just um, yeah, pass on the mic briefly for the first comment and then we can uh, still uh, continue with one or two additional questions. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much. I'm just uh, moving over here. Yeah, hello. Um, as you uh, have seen, the uh, major of the city of Potsdam was announced, and um, unfortunately, he can't take uh, place here today and uh, take part here at this uh, event. And so, quite very spontaneously, let's say just a few hours ago, um, Uli Weinberg just asked me, um, could you say some words, let's say, for the city of Potsdam? So it's a, a kind honor to me uh, to represent the city of Potsdam. Just to introduce myself, my name is Götz Friedrich, and uh, I'm uh, in my professional life, I'm a attorney at law, a tax lawyer, and uh, next to my profession, I'm a member of the city council of the city of Potsdam and the chairman of the economic advisory board of the city of Potsdam and member of the board of the digitalization uh, advisory board of the city of Potsdam. And that's why I was asked. Now, uh, concerning the topic innovation in the public sector, and it was already mentioned, um, in the sense of a digital innovation and implementing the design thinking process, for me, it's first of all a question of mindset within the public administration, or let's say, furthermore, a change of mindset in, within the public administration. People living and working in Potsdam are probably, like most people in Germany and the cities, more or less regular faced with uh, public administrations, which, as it seems to be at least, is a problem oriented bureaucratic administration rather than an administration which is looking forward helping people and businesses to get things solved and done. Now, it said public administration is complicated, slow, formalistic, and uh, more opponent than a companion towards meeting and satisfying the needs of people and business. But today, and that's the advantage we have implementing and using the skills and possibilities of digitalized systems and with that design thing processes. For the first time in years, we have the chance and that we can take the opportunity to realize something that's what we call Potsdam becoming a city as a service. Therefore, and that for that reason, uh, about year, one year ago, Potsdam applied to become a so-called Smart City Potsdam. Um, the title is Smart City Potsdam, Innovative, Green and Just, and together we are creating a sustainable city for tomorrow. And uh, what are we going to do? We took uh, some uh, examples, for example, Ronald Berger, you probably know the consulting, Roland Berger, some years ago, defined Vienna to be the most uh, smart city in the world. And we had a look at it and characterized that they had an integrated strategic approach, an open data platform, and by the implementation of innovative single projects. So that's what we are going to do right now uh, as the city of Potsdam. We are now in a strategic developing phase. We have some key aspects to strengthen the ability and capacity of the city to act to develop the growth of the city in a cautious way, to counter the climate change, to extend participation and to promote a sustainable relation between the city and the region. And all this we do 
and we are very lucky to have the HPID school here in the city of Potsdam. Of course, in a close relation to the D school, for example, if we think of implementing um, uh, what they had in Stockholm, for example, the um, Potsdam lab. Hopefully, it will not close one day, so uh, we are looking forward to, to implement that very much. But as I said, the success of this process, that means innovation in a public sector by implementing digitalized systems and uh, design thinking, is well, will depend very much on a change of the mindset within the public administration. So far from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. in so spontaneously to um, also present the city of Potsdam's uh, perspective on the um, yeah, digitalization and smart city uh, initiatives. So thank you. Um, I will pick up one question uh, from the online panel or the online audience. Um, and this, I think, um, yeah, let's see. Maybe Christina can actually answer this question directly. Because if we talk about design thinking and human-centered design, of course, um, a mindset of failure and trying and trying again is very important. But we do not assume <laughs> that governments and administrations are working in this kind of way of working traditionally. <laughs> so what is actually um, the first steps that uh, you need to do or what are the, the recommendations actually to get, yeah, to teach the administration to teach the government to become more of a failure culture or embrace it? Um, super good question. Um, we try to speak of learning culture instead of failure culture, um, but obviously it has aspects of you, you, you fail along the process. Um, we, I'd say three things come to my mind. The first one is expectation management. We position the need to, how to say, confront products or confront ideas with the reality as soon as possible as one of the basic, like the foundations of the work we do, the way we work. Um, and that obviously is a way to control risks to a manageable amount. So basically we try to fail small and learn quickly in order to then scale, but hopefully have learn so much along the way that we don't go out with a product um, very late with a big bang and you risk failing at a large scale, uh, which is something that government understandably is quite scared about. Um, the second thing is that when you work iteratively, um, the failing part is actually part of the process. So we try to give space to reflect upon what we've learned and basically reframe what failing feels like. And we are quite transparent about the fact that it is hard. Then that's probably the third point. Um, we have some amazing designers in our team that also share their experience and their um, basically their growth pain when you realize actually you have to detach yourself from the ideas that you have and from the things that you think about and you have like it's quite hard to put unfinished ideas out there and get critical feedback and then to iteratively get better but giving that kind of this human side on an individual level to show that also for us it's like it's quite a challenging process at times but it helps us to become better quickly um that i think is something that helps when in the projects people from within government who are used to um, not being allowed to make mistakes because it might hinder their career or it might reflect bad on them, um, that it's actually a good thing and also a good thing for their personal development. Thank you so much um, for this, uh, yeah, 
again, three, three very wise hints and three uh, deep insights into the way that you're working. And I am very well aware that we're at the end of the time, but I would like to use the chance since Christian Basin is here and there is one question, another version of this question, I would say, uh, that has just been answered, um, also coming in from the online audience. And that is how can we get leaders in the government to work openly against conventional wisdom? Um, any tips on how to bring that to the discussion table? That's a very, very good question. Uh, when I decided to write uh, my uh, doctoral thesis about design thinking in government, uh, I, I realized that maybe 80 to 90 percent of public managers can actually embrace openness and uh, are uh, because they're so passionate about the role and the potential of positive change for society, they, they are actually open and willing to challenge their assumptions if somebody helps them with it. But about 10 to 20 percent are probably not. And so what my first part of the answer is to avoid the 10 to 20 percent and don't uh, spend your time and energy on trying to uh, convince them. The other 80 percent, I think it's about exposing them to design work and, and bringing them into the room uh, hands on to take part in processes, especially around, as we heard many of the excellent speakers say this morning, into processes of, of working with human insight, working with the user uh, needs, not just the ones they, they, they know they have, but also the, the latent needs, and, and help them with that eye-opener it is to really get those insights. I think that's the starting point. And if you do that, that's the beginning of a journey, like an eye-opener, I think, to, to, uh, to really challenge their assumptions. So it starts and ends really with the des design work. All right, thank you very much um, also for this statement. Um, we will wrap up this panel. Um, Angela, do you have a closing word? I will leave it with you. Uh, thank you so much. No, actually, I don't want to just uh, mess up the time. I am totally honored, happy as, yeah, a very, very happy to be here to discuss with you. And also, thank you to the audience, uh, online audience. Let's keep the conversation going. This is the only way we can actually bring transformation, whether it's digitalization or by post-its or whatever, but really uh, transformation in the public value of everything that we do. It's about talking and so much. Uh, so thank you so much to the speakers. Time for applause. <laughs> yes. The next sessions, both here and on the main stage, will start in five minutes. So get ready, find your spots, and see you again in five minutes.